Um, you know, I want to start out with one thing, and that is a lot of people, when I talk about this issue, will say something like, you know, <laughs> at St. Thomas, how is this received, or how do you get along with the people who disagree with you? I have um, one of the biggest proponents of the amendment, um, Professor Teresa Collette, is in the office next to me. Uh, Robert Delahunty's down the hall. And I do disagree with them. I disagree with them very much on this issue, and, and some other things as well. But it's very important to me that, that we have that discussion. I, I learned something pretty fascinating about this, that like the, the Waterloo moment for me in understanding how that works in the school was when I was in law school. When I was in law school, there was a, a dean, and he was about five foot two, Guido Calabresi, which may be the best dean name ever. And he had a little goatee, and he was a brilliant, brilliant man. He taught torts to every single person that went through Yale Law School. He's on the Second Circuit now. Uh, he taught President Clinton torts and was rewarded by uh, being advanced up to the Second Circuit. He's the only federal judge ever to write a dissent to his own opinion, which he did. Uh, and and he, was, he was really a character. I, my parents were visiting one weekend, and we were standing in the middle of the hallway, and Calabresi, he ran every place, and he's running down the hall, and he skids to a stop, and he says, Mark, are these your parents? And I said, yes. And he punched my dad on the shoulder and said, that was a tort. And then he kept running down the hall. And my parents were asking, you know, who is this? And I said, it's the dean. But this is the guy who settled a controversy in an amazing way. And it was, it was this, that the Black Student Association had invited one of Louis Farrakhan's deputies to come speak, a guy named John Muhammad. And the Jewish students were up in arms about this. And on the day that Muhammad was supposed to come speak, uh, the Jewish students were picketing in front of the, in front of the school that, that Muhammad shouldn't be allowed to speak. And I, I wasn't involved very much in, on either side in this, and I was out getting pizza or something. I'm walking back, and I see the, the picketers going back and forth. And Calabresi runs up to them, and he says, what are you doing? Are you here to welcome our guest? And they said, no, no, we don't, we don't want him to come here. He's anti-Semitic and horrible, and uh, you know, we don't think he should speak here. And Calabresi said, if he's anti-Semitic and horrible, don't you want him to come here to speak? And they looked kind of baffled, and, and they said, well, no. And Calabresi said, well, if we don't let him speak, how can you ever tell him why he's wrong? And with that, some of the people started to drift away. Uh, and he continued that conversation about how they were going to be giving up their chance to have that dialogue with someone they really disagreed with. Um, and I've, I've carried that with me. Uh, and yeah, there's a lot of people that are on the other side from me on the amendment. Um, I do my best to understand where they're coming from because if I'm going to convince people who are on the other side or who are undecided, I have to understand why it is they feel that way. And that's an important, important starting point. Um, I want to tell you a little bit of the background of, of why I came to care about this issue. Because I didn't for a long time. Um, I grew up in a suburb outside Detroit. Um, grew up playing hockey. I grew up in a pretty homophobic environment. Uh, like a lot of people of my generation did. And in fact, I, I probably uh, engaged in some form of verbal bullying at times, I'm sure. I never really thought about it. Um, and I went, after I was a federal prosecutor, I took a job at Baylor down in Texas. Now Baylor is a school that affirmatively, affirmatively discriminates against gay men and lesbians. I don't think they even know what transgendered people are, or bisexuals. Uh, that they're not hired as faculty or staff, and they're not supposed to enroll as students. Um, and I went and worked there anyways. Uh, worked there for 10 years. But after a while, that didn't seem right. And I moved up here, took the job at St. Thomas. St. Thomas isn't like that at all. Um, I have gay colleagues, and they're, they're welcomed. Um, and so I wrote a, I, I thought through 
why that was wrong. And I thought through why I had been wrong for so long about this. And so I, I wrote a piece um, called Repentance of an Anti-Gay Bigot that ran in the Huffington Post. And I got a lot of response to it. Um, I heard from a lot of people I had known in my life uh, who, it turns out, had been gay the whole time. Um, and, and one of the things that was really heart-wrenching about that was that I heard from a lot of my former students at Baylor who wrote to me and said, Professor Osler, maybe you remember me. And uh, I always did. I remembered what they were like in class. I remembered what they were like socially. Um, but I didn't know they were gay. And that's what they were writing to tell me. And they wrote to tell me not only that they were gay, but what it had meant that when they were in law school at Baylor, they had had to hide that. Um, and it was really hard. For many of them, they had been out and then when they went to go, go to law school, they had to go back in the closet. They had to give up someone who they loved in some cases. One of the people who wrote to me was Joy Tall, who some of you here know. Um, and she wrote a letter saying, you know, Professor Osler, this is who I am. This is what the cost was of going to a place like that. And I felt deeply chastened that it had never mattered to me, that I hadn't thought that through. That I never looked out at a class of 85 students and thought, <laughs> maybe some of them are gay. Um, turns out they were, some of them. So I wrote, I, you know, if you're a professor, that's what you can do. You can write about stuff. So I wrote an editorial about Baylor needing to change its policy. And I called up a buddy down at the Waco Tribune Herald and said, you know, I, I think you guys should run this. And he said, well, I'll pass it on to the editorial board. And they said, sure. And they gave me a date that it was going to run on a Sunday, which is a great day to have an op-ed in. And so I made a plan, which was to go down to Waco right after it appeared. And I set up some interviews with NPR and some TV stations and things, because I really wanted to confront this issue at, at, at Baylor. And I woke up that Sunday morning and um, went online and looked at the Waco Tribune Herald, and the story wasn't there. The owner, it turns out, of the newspaper was a trustee of Baylor and had spiked the story. Uh, now, here's the irony of that. You know, I, I, I was pretty pissed off when I saw that. Um, it's not censorship in the sense of free speech, because the free speech for a newspaper is of the person who owns the paper. Not me. I understand that. But I think it was cowardly not to run it. Um, and once I'm mad, that's when I really try to get working. And so instead of canceling my trip, what I did is I wrote to my editor at the Huffington Post and said, here's what happened. That piece got spiked. This piece got spiked. And I want you to put it on the front page of the Huffington Post. And he did. And instead of 3,000 people seeing it, 200,000 people saw it. Um, and I went down to Baylor. And you know what? It turned out that there was a student group forming, a gay and lesbian student group. And they were meeting the day that I happened to be there. And I got to sit down and talk to them. And I got to talk to the TV station. And I got to talk to the newspapers. Um, the president of Baylor right now is Ken Starr. But what's interesting you know, it's not like he called me up when I got back. But I, I do think that he's taking into account the way that the world is changing. Um, and so when I heard about the amendment here, I knew that I had to engage with it. And engage with it in a particular way. One of the things that I teach is advocacy. And there's certain principles of advocacy that I, I hold very dear. And one of them is this is that if you are going to change the world through advocacy, even a little, you can't do it by talking to people who already agree with you. That I'm not going to be able to have an impact on this election, for example, by talking to people who agree with me. I have to find a way to talk to people or write for people who are on the other side. And part of that is that I have to identify one of their interests and then go towards that. And that's what I've tried to do with the marriage amendment. I, um, it's unusual that, that I would come and speak to a group that identifies itself as liberal, because I assume that the people here agree with me. Um, but you had me at drinking, so. 
I do speak to a fair number of conservative churches. Um, and when I do talk to people who are on the other side or haven't decided, generally people who are moderate conservative to conservative, there's a couple arguments I make. And if you are talking to people, I'm going to suggest this to you as well. That, I mean, <laughs> you are engaged, many of you, in conversations with people who disagree with you. And if you haven't yet, you probably will at Thanksgiving dinner. Um, but if you are talking to somebody about this, the first thing to do is figure out what their legitimate interests are. Because sometimes there is one. For example, one thing that people on the other side of this debate will often say, and I think they believe it, is that children are important. That it's about children, because children are better off with a mother and a father. They're better off with two parents. And we've all heard that, I think, as we've heard the discussions of this issue. Now, the thing about that is this. There's an underlying fact, and the underlying fact is gay men and lesbians have children. They have children right now. They're allowed to have children. And if that person that I'm talking to believes that a child is better off with their parents being in a married relationship, then the best thing for that child is that those parents have that opportunity. I'm saying to them that for the children, marriage is the best thing. And it's hard for them to refute any of those tenets that lead to that conclusion. Um, the constitutional argument is important too. And this is what I wrote about in the Star Tribune a few weeks ago. And it's this, that a constitution is different than a law. And this is one of the geniuses of the framers of this republic, is that they constructed the constitution in a way to protect individual liberty and to create a federalist system. They didn't include things in there that restricted personal liberty. And as the Constitution's been amended, both in Minnesota and federally, those restrictions, with those amendments, with one exception, have not restricted individual liberty. That one exception was prohibition. And that didn't work so well, yeah. That, uh, so understanding the difference between a Constitution and a law, this constitutional idea that a constitution restrains government, prevents government from intruding on individual liberty, is something that's a conservative idea. It was Alexander Hamilton's idea. That's where it comes from. And in most respects, conservatives buy that ideal, that the, cons that the constitution restrains government from interfering with individual freedoms. You're, you're, there's few Americans that are gonna disagree with that. This amendment does the opposite. It uses the Constitution to restrain individual freedoms. Um, you know, they could have done that when they wrote the Constitution because there was such an issue at that time, which was mixed race marriages. Um, black and whites marrying one another was explicitly illegal in the majority of the colonies. Uh, now, did they put that in the Constitution? Of course not. And it would have seemed ridiculous to them to have done so. Um, and it should seem ridiculous to us now to put that kind of restriction on it. Now, I'm a lawyer, I do research, and so when I wrote that piece, one of the things I did was I pulled up all of the amendments that have been created so far uh, to the Minnesota Constitution. And when I read through those, it was striking. There was a lot of them that had to do with budget issues and taxing. There were some that had to do with the structure of government. There were a few that were about expanding personal liberties. For example, allowing women to vote. <laughs> Yay. There wasn't one that restricted a personal liberty. That if this amendment passes, it will be the first that does that. It will change the nature of what our Constitution does in a fundamental way. And that's something that's bigger than even this issue. And it's something that people, regardless of whether they want gay marriage or not, can support. The outcome that I want out of this vote is for that amendment to be defeated. And if I'm talking to someone and I can convince them to vote no, because of that constitutional argument, 
It's not necessary for me to go the rest of the way and convince them right then that we should have gay marriage in the state. That will be the next question. But this question is important, and it does include things like the nature of a constitution. Um, and I, I am very uh, serious when I say that social justice happens when opposing minds come into conflict. Uh, and, th and together you make social justice. You know, if I disagree with somebody on one of these issues, which one of us is doing social justice? Well, I think I am, and she thinks she is. But the truth is, it's like the Super Bowl. You know, in the Super Bowl, there's these two teams, they're slamming into each other, they're competing. What if only one team showed up? The project isn't really about that game. It's about having the game. And the truth comes out of that. Now, one side's going to win, and I want that side to be mine. But it's not going to happen unless there's that engagement. And it's important to take that step. One of the things I do a lot of work on is the death penalty. I'm against the death penalty. Um, and in Texas, almost everybody who supports the death penalty is a Christian. Uh, in California, where they're having a referendum this fall, almost everybody who supports the death penalty is a Christian. Um, a lot of people who are against the death penalty aren't Christian, but, uh, and that means that if I want to affect the death penalty outcome in a state like Texas or California or Virginia, I have to go talk to Christians. And that's what we've been doing. And we've been doing it by doing the trial of Jesus, uh, the sentencing phase, and then doing it under state rules and then having the audience serve as the jury. It puts into juxtaposition the unjust execution at the center of the faith with what they do in that state. And we can have that engagement with people otherwise we couldn't reach to talk to about the death penalty. Next month we're gonna do it at Regent University, which is Pat Robertson's school. And then we're going out to Fuller Seminary in Azusa Pacific, out in the West Coast, out in California, which are conservative places. Um, I want to leave a lot of time for Q&A, so I'm going to uh, close out this part of it with something. It's a, um, it's a story I tell a lot, and I, the students got to meet the person I'm going to talk about here. But uh, when I was a federal prosecutor, I did it because I really believed in prosecution. I still believe in prosecution in a lot of cases. Um, I went back after law school to the city I was from. I went back to Detroit. I lived in the city. I was a prosecutor in the city. And that was a city that had suffered a lot of disasters. And one of them was crack. Crack did a lot to decimate what was left of Detroit at that time. You can go very close to where I grew up, and there's block after block with nothing left. It's just vacant blocks, not just lots, but entire blocks. And so I prosecuted a lot of crack cases. In that 100 to 1 ratio, was in place in the mandatory federal sentencing guidelines where one gram of crack was sentenced the same as 100 grams of powder. And I was okay with that. I asked for sentences under that ratio all the time. And I did it because I thought it was right. I thought it would deter crime. I thought it would bring crack under control. Um, and time and again, I went to a sentencing and said, Your Honor, we want a high sentence because of the seriousness of this crime. One day in 1997, I had a sentencing of a guy named Anthony Shepard. He'd gone to trial. 18-year-old uh, kid. He had no prior convictions. The ATF had gone into an abandoned house and found him there. He had 5.3 grams of crack on him and a gun shoved under a seat cushion on a couch. Um, went to trial. Convicted. The sentencing was going to be easy because under the law at that time, it was a mandatory 10-year sentence. Five years for the crack and five years for the gun stacked. So this 18-year-old, and there's no parole in the federal system, was going to be in prison for almost all of the next 10 years. And again, I was fine with that. I was there, in fact, at the sentencing to ask the judge to do exactly that, and she had to do it if I asked for it because it was mandatory. And so I walked across the street and went to the court, and I didn't even bring the file. I didn't need to. It was a mandatory sentence. And the judge turned to me and said, Mr. Osler, what do you want? And I said, 10 years, it's a mandatory five and five, Your Honor. And she turned to my opposing counsel, the guy named Andrew Densimo, and said, Mr. Densimo, 
are you going to make your usual futile argument? And he said, yes, I will. Mm. And he went on for 20 minutes. And he talked about how we weren't achieving law enforcement objectives because crack was sold by the people at the bottom of the pyramid. It was the same as arresting the greeter at Walmart. He talked about the effect on his community, the black community in Detroit. He talked about how crack had gotten worse the more people we took off the street and how the effect of that was depopulating these neighborhoods of anybody who had any entrepreneurial ability given the lack of other opportunities. And he went on and on and after 20 minutes the judge turned to me and said, well, Mr. Osler, and I said, it's five and five, Your Honor, it's a mandatory sentence. And she gave Anthony Shepard 10 years and the marshals came and cuffed him and took him off to serve his sentence. And I walked back across the street to my office, and there were some people sitting around, and they said, what did you have? And I said, you know, five and five, a crack case. And they said, oh, was it Densimo? And I said, yeah. And they said, did he give his usual futile argument? And we kind of laughed about that. Um, but it worked on me. And I didn't, you know, when you change someone's mind, we have this myth of capitulation. That if your argument is right, the person's going to start to cry and then say, you're right, you're right, I was wrong all along. That doesn't happen. Think back on your own life about something important you changed your mind about. It didn't happen like that. It happened over a period of weeks where you realized that person was right. And probably you didn't go back and tell them, boy, you were right about that. What happened is sometime later you were talking to someone else and you realized you were using their argument. And that's what happened with Densimo. And after a little while, I couldn't be a prosecutor anymore. And so I went to be a teacher. I went back to my law school. I went back to Yale, asked the person, how do you become a law teacher? And she turned around, she took a one-page sheet out of her credenza and said, you fill this out and you mail it in. And I thought, that sounds like a scam. Um, but in fact, that's how it works. You go to this big conference and you have interviews. And I got the job at Baylor and went down there. And when I went down there, I started working with the ACLU on some of these crack cases. We started challenging that 100 to 1 ratio. And I was a spectacular failure. I personally argued and lost this issue in the First Circuit in Boston, the Second Circuit in New York, the Third Circuit in Philadelphia, and, and this has to be some kind of federal record, I lost on consecutive days in the Eighth and Ninth Circuits. Um, but the case out of the Eighth Circuit, Spears, we took to the Supreme Court and we won. And Justice Scalia wrote the opinion under the Sixth Amendment. Uh, and it came out, and what it said, his opinion said that judges can categorically reject the 100 to 1 ratio. And district court judges loved that. And there was a judge in Detroit named Art Tarnow. And Judge Tarnow called me up, and he said, Osler, what happened to you? I, I mean, I remember when you were a prosecutor, and you seemed to have switched sides or something. And I, I said, well, and I told him the story about Andrew Densimo. And he paused for a minute and he asked, did you ever tell Andrew that? And this was 13 years later after his futile speech. And I hadn't. I hadn't talked to him much since then. Not at all since I'd left for Texas. So I called him up and I said, did you see the opinion that came out? And he said, yeah. And he said, that was my, I said, that was my case. That's because of your futile speech. You changed my mind. So futile speeches are worth having. They're worth making. And I, I think sometimes people of strong conviction, and I think that's most of us here, sometimes we get discouraged because we talk to people and they don't come up to us afterwards and say you were right. But that doesn't mean that you didn't change their mind. If it wasn't for somebody who was willing to make that futile speech, I wouldn't have taken such a different path. And there's a lot of people like me out there, um, and it's worth having those conversations.